Welcome. Welcome Healthy Lifestyles participants. We're happy that you were with us today to talk about mammograms and breast health. And I want to remind you, we still have a couple of spots left at the South Redwood Mammovan site. This will take place next month on November. Let me make sure I get the date right. November 29th. If this is something you're interested in, I will put the link in the chat box. Her speaker is probably not. And Kim, do you mind making me a panelist so I can share the Mammovan link with our participants? Sadie, you are a panelist. Oh, are you there? Hi, this is Sadie. Sadie. Yes, where'd I go? Oh, I see. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. I figured it out. Okay, hey, everyone. I'm I'm sorry. These she's okay. having trouble with. There we go. I think that might have affected. Um, so, unmute maybe. Can you? Okay. Can you hear Tim talking on the presentation? Is she talking right now? Oh, see, we can hear you. Lori, go ahead and start. I very I can barely hear Kim in the background. <laughs> oh well, but it's just on my phone. Sorry. Um, yeah, so right now you're unmuted. So go ahead and just start giving the presentation. Okay. All right. And we can hear you. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, hello, everybody. It's good to be with you today. And um, I'm excited to be sharing with you a little bit about taking care of your breasts and more importantly, just taking care of your health in general. So. We are going to talk about breasts today and hopefully help you identify if you have any personal risk factors for breast cancer, maybe help you identify some lifestyles behavior, lifestyle behaviors um, that might contribute to breast cancer and also recognize some abnormalities when you're doing your self breast exams and then also help you determine when you should get a mammogram. Um, this can be different for everybody, so we want to help you identify that for your particular situation. So just a few statistics about breast cancer in the U.S. There are nearly 300,000 new cases of invasive breast cancer each year and 43,600 breast cancer deaths. In recent years, the rates have increased a little bit. Um, Breast cancer is the second leading cause of cancer deaths in women, but lung cancer actually kills more women than breast cancer does. Um, we are getting a little bit better at treatment, um, quite a bit better, and so death rates from breast cancer have dropped significantly um, over the years. Part of this is due to treatment, but a lot of this is also due to early detection. So why do we get breast cancer? Let me show you briefly a little bit um, about how our breasts work. Breast tissue is one of the few tissues that continues to grow and develop over our lifespan. There aren't very many tissues that do this. And the first stage of development, of course, is in fetal development, but only the nipple and the areola are formed. And it's not until adolescence um, when most breast development starts to occur, and it's finalized by about age 20. The last stage is when we um, get pregnant, and the final stage of maturation occurs during breastfeeding. So the breast tissue changes over the course of our lives. 
And in this pretty um, and very colorful picture of a breast, I just want to point out a couple of things. Um, I think of the breast as having two kinds of tissue. There's the glandular tissue, which is the milk making parts, and that includes the lobules where milk is made, and then the ducts where milk travels out to feed the baby. Most of the rest of our breast tissue is this yellow part, and it's mostly fat, and then there are supportive ligaments as well. So when we talk about breast cancer and abnormalities, most of those develop within the glandular system of the breast or the milk making part. I'm always amazed after looking at breasts for the last 30 years or so at the infinite variety in the type and shapes of breast. And I'm also always surprised at how many women feel like they have abnormal breasts. So this is just to sort of normalize the variety for you and say that breasts do come in all different shapes and sizes and they are can all be considered normal. So how do we keep our breasts healthy? Are there things that we can do to reduce our risk of developing breast cancer? If you look at this list, the factors on the left are, of course, more numerous. The list is more lengthy, and those are the factors that really that we don't have any power to change. The factors on the right are the ones that we do have some power over. So your greatest risk for breast cancer is being female, and the second is aging. And then the rest of these risk factors are um, kind of fall into place. So if you have a family history, you're at a little bit higher risk. If you have an inherited genetic disorder, such as a mutation in the BRCA gene, you're at a higher risk. By your race and ethnicity, you are at higher risk. The thought is that being taller, you might have a little bit higher risk. Having dense breast tissue can put you at higher risk, and we'll talk more about that in just a minute. And the other risk factor that has a lot to do with the other um, practices in our life is our exposure to estrogen over the years. And this is something that for the most part, we don't have control over. So the longer our breast tissue is exposed to estrogen, the greater our risk for breast cancer. So for instance, if you started menstruating at a younger age and go through menopause at a later age, your breasts have had a longer period of exposure to estrogen. There are certain benign breast conditions that can put you at higher risk, and then having a previous breast cancer also puts you at higher risk for another breast cancer. Then there are some risk factors. These are not necessarily causal factors, but these things are associated with a higher risk for breast cancer. And we'll talk about some of these in detail since these are the things that we do have some control over. So drinking alcohol, being overweight or obese, being physically inactive, having children before the age of 30, um, and breastfeeding them at risk can reduce our risk for breast cancer. Hormonal birth control for long periods of time and hormone therapy after menopause for long periods of time can also increase our risk for breast cancer. So let's talk a little bit about this issue of breast density and why it matters. Unless you've had a mammogram and somebody has told you that you have dense breast tissue, you will not know if you do or not. But dense breast tissue has more glandular tissue, which is changing and growing um, at a faster rate. And so there's a higher risk of developing cancer. And the more dense our tissue, tissue is, the more the risk is. Um, breast density is something that should be considered along with other risk factors, such as increasing age, our family history, and maybe a history of a breast biopsy that showed atypia. Um, whoops, didn't mean to do that. Um, and breast density is described on a scale of one to four features. So the first level um, is not very dense breast tissue. That would be considered A, and those are breasts that are mostly fatty tissue. This is more common after menopause when the glandular or milk-making part of the tissue kind of atrophies or gets smaller since it's not used anymore. 
then it could be described as scattered fibroglandular densities. Moving up the scale, the breast could be heterogeneously dense, and then the highest level of density would be extremely breast dense breast tissue. Um, and a couple of comments related to breast density and mammography is that 3D mammography can help us see lumps in tissue that's a little more dense. Um, so that's been a really valuable uh, technology to have. And at St. Mark's, now all women get 3D mammography um, screening breast exams. Um, and we just take care of that cost, whether your insurance covers it or not. Um, Sometimes when the dense, when the tissue is really dense, additional imaging methods are needed like ultrasound or breast MRI. And you're more likely to have dense breast tissue if you are premenopausal, if you're quite thin, or if you are postmenopausal, but using hormone replacement therapy. So let's look at a couple of pictures of mammograms, and then I think this will make more sense. So starting on the left, if you're a radiologist looking at mammograms, this picture on the left shows fatty breast tissue and you can see it's mostly gray. There's very little white in there and it makes it very easy to see if there is a more dense lump in that tissue. In the second category, that would be considered scattered fibroglandular tissue and there's a little bit of area here that is a bit more white and you may have scattered areas like that. Then there's heterogeneously dense breast tissue, and you can see there are patches of white kind of all over this mammogram. And then in the final level of density, extremely dense breast tissue, you can see that this white tissue is quite difficult to see abnormalities through. So the 3D mammogram is able to kind of take pictures as if the breast were seen in slices. And then the radiologist can view that as a video and they can look at these kind of individual layers of breast tissue, which is very helpful with this dense breast tissue to see if there are any um, changes in that. So let's talk for a minute now about what are the genetic components of breast cancer. Well, some women inherit a mutation in the genes called BRCA1 and BRCA2. Um, these confer a high risk of breast cancer, but the good news is that these mutations are not very common. In the number of women who get breast cancer, only 5 to 10 percent of the cases are associated with a mutation in these BRCA1 and 2 genes. But it is important that you know your family history of cancer, your blood relatives from both sides of the family. So mother and father's lines both contribute to your genetics. So it's important to understand who has cancer on both sides of the family. It's also helpful if you know about what a person's age was when they developed cancer. And then you want your physician to know that information so that they can help guide you about when you should start getting mammograms and how often you need them and perhaps if there is additional imaging that should be added to your screening protocol. I'm going to come back to this phrase, but I really want this to be the take home message. If you don't take time for your wellness, you will be forced to take time for your illness and. Um, you know, as women, I think it's easy for us to get busy. We're oftentimes busy taking care of everyone but ourselves. And so I just want to encourage you that it is so crucial that you take time for your wellness, whether that's getting health screenings done, whether that's trying to have a better balance in your life of leisure time and activity, um, and also time to make sure that you're attentive to your nutrition and eating in a healthy way. So breast cancer is slowly on the rise, not dramatically fast, but it is increasing. And if we look at what are some of the reasons that that is happening, there are a few things that stand out. So life has changed. Not sure if you've noticed this, but um, life has changed both inside our bodies and outside of our bodies, and it has changed the way that we live. So we need to focus our efforts on the ways that we can reduce our risks um, and be willing to rethink maybe some of our everyday choices 
be willing to change some of our old habits and be attentive to what we're eating, drinking, and breathing. Um, being careful what we use in the kitchen from our pantry, from the cleaning products we use and the medicine cabinets. Um, when we think about things like chemical exposures that might increase risk for breast cancer. So what can contribute to the rise? Well, women are living longer and the longer we live, the greater the chance that our cells are going to have a mutation at some point in time that may cause cancer. Puberty and breast development are happening at an earlier stage and the earlier breasts develop, the longer time there is to be exposed to stimulating or altering substances that could increase the risk of breast cancer. More women are delaying pregnancy or not having full term um, pregnancies. And so the longer pregnancy is delayed, the greater the risk it seems um, for breast cancer. This is not an enormous risk, but there is some risk. The more children you have at a younger age, the more times estrogen is disrupted and not affecting those breast cells. More adolescents and women take prescription hormones in the form of birth control um, or also hormone replacement therapy. And it's not that hormones should never be taken, but they should be taken in the lowest dose for the shortest amount of time necessary. Being overweight and being obese also increases our risk for breast cancer, especially if we have been um, on the more lower weight scale and then all of a sudden in midlife or postmenopausal, we become overweight. And the reason for that, as you might guess, is related to estrogen and our fat cells continue to make estrogen even when our ovaries start to slow down the production of estrogen. Big doses of high calorie foods on a frequent basis can also trigger hormonal activity, increasing estrogen, which probably increases cell growth, thereby increasing the risk for breast cancer. And obesity is also associated with chronic inflammation and inflammation in our bodies produce chemicals that can damage our cells and can make it harder for our immune system to work properly and heal the damage to those cells. So inflammation is an enormous factor in risk for all types of cancers. So what's the connection with obesity and cancer? Diet is thought to be partly responsible for 30 to 40% of all cancers. Being overweight or obese is linked with a higher risk of 13 different types of cancer. And the incidence of almost all obesity related cancers is rising because obesity is rising in our population. And the connection again is that increasing estrogen, increasing insulin and increasing inflammation. And oftentimes the effect of foods directly. <clears throat> Being physically inactive is also associated with a higher risk. Um, and our culture is getting um, in some sectors, more active um, as there has been a focus on um, encouraging people to get outside and get active. But, um, you know, in general, a lot of people are still really physically inactive and being ex getting exercise throughout your life, even during pregnancy, even as an older woman is very, very important. If you're anything like me, we continue to say, Starting tomorrow, I'm going to get up at 5 a.m. to work out. 5 a.m. comes around and you think, who said that? Um, or, you know, we have lofty goals, but sometimes we peter out quickly. The recommendation is for four to seven hours per week, but anything that we do in terms of physical activity is better than nothing. And it doesn't all have to be intense you know, um, interval training type of exercise, even though that is good for us. But walk, mix it up, have fun, get out, rake leaves, um, work in the garden, just play and have fun. So moderate intensity for four to seven hours a week is the best.
if we look at just choosing in a more healthy way. This doesn't necessarily have to be making enormous lifestyle changes, but make it your goal to just choose more fruits and vegetables whole grains, beans, nuts, and seeds. Try to get at least five cups of fruits and vegetables a day. Even that can make a difference in our health. And choose different colors of produce. That will be the best insurance that you'll get a variety of nutrients that your body needs. Fruits and vegetables and whole grains also provide fiber, which can help us feel more full, and it keeps our gut moving along. It's also recommended that we eat a variety of proteins so that we're not eating only red meats or processed meats, but that we mix in things like eggs, beans, lentils, chicken, um, and fish as good lean sources of protein. Let's talk for just a minute about it, just a minute about the risk um, associated with consuming alcohol. Occasional alcohol is probably fine but it's alcohol on this regular daily basis um, and more than one drink of alcohol per day that seems to confer the greatest risk and once again it messes with our estrogen it interferes with the breakdown of estrogen it can increase the production of estrogen and it can also make the estrogen receptors that we have on our breast cells more sensitive to damaging effects from estrogen and it may directly alter our DNA. So for cancer prevention, the official recommendation is don't drink alcohol, but if you do, limit your intake. Two standard drinks for men and one drink for women, one glass of alcohol, one small beer. Um, so limiting or better yet, eliminating consumption of alcohol to decrease risk. Other things that are associated with a higher risk for breast cancer are smoking, low vitamin D levels, poor sleep, and stress. Many women still smoke, so stopping smoking or limiting your exposure to secondhand smoke is a helpful thing to do. Getting outdoors in general, because most of the time, the outdoor air is healthier than it is indoors, Although sometimes when we have inversions and a lot of smoke in the environment, that's arguable. Um, having low levels of vitamin D can be problematic as well. So make sure you're getting a little bit of sunshine each day. Um, supplement with vitamin D3 if needy, needed and eat oily types of fish. We are often as women sleep deprived, sleep deprived and stress and repair of cells is a constant continuous process, but much of the healing that occurs in damaged cells and just internal housekeeping and detoxification occurs at night while we sleep. So getting adequate sleep is very, very important. Fear, depression, and anxiety um, can not only mess with the chemicals in our body, but it can ruin our quality of life. Stop judging yourself and holding on to the expectations of others. Don't take on too much. Determine where boundaries need to be set and when you need to say no. And take care of yourself. Do what enhances your emotional comfort and joy as much as possible. Pollutants are everywhere that we live, and I don't want to overrate this exposure to pollutants, but, you know, when we think about why is disease increasing in our body, we do have to look at some of these things that are in our environment. Um, and the more green that we can live, the more healthy we're likely to be in the foods that we eat and the water we drink in the air that we breathe and in the products that we use. So byproducts that aren't made with as many fragrances, hormones, and preservatives. Instead of a moisturizer with a ton of ingredients you can't pronounce, for instance, choose things that are a little more simple, like cocoa butter, olive oil, or coconut oil. And be selective in your foods and beverages. Select the healthiest products you can and prepare them carefully. In those dirty dozen 
foods, so those that are um, considered more important to buy in an organic way because they're more likely to have pesticide residues and um, other chemicals that might be harmful to us. And there are um, lists on the web of what the clean 15 and what the dirty dozen are that can kind of help you um, when you go to buy organic foods because let's face it, organic foods are more expensive. So if you focus on buying organic for those that are the dirty dozen, um, you can save a little bit of money that way. And the clean 15, you don't need to buy organic. Things like bananas that have thick peels um, are fine to buy in a non-organic type. Use as many green household products as you can. And avoid microwaving in food in plastic containers, especially those that have the BPAs in them. Um, this has gotten a lot better and many of the plastic um, containers that we use now are free of some of these harmful, harmful substances. Avoid grilling things like meat at a super high heat where you get that char. Those can contain some carcinogenic substances. And avoid using nonstick pots and pans at a super high heat. Those can also give off some harmful substances. So let's go ahead and switch now to what are mammo mammograms and when should we get them? The guidelines for when people should get mammograms have changed some over the last 10 years. And I think it's gotten a little bit more confusing about when we should start getting mammograms. So what is a mammogram? Let's start there. So a mammogram is a low energy, low dose x-ray that basically looks at the breasts for diagnosis and screening. The goal is early detection of breast cancer. And I can't overemphasize the importance of the early detection of breast cancer. Breast cancer can be a curable disease when we find it at its earliest stages with the most minimal of treatment. So we want to be finding these cancers at a very early stage when they're easier to treat and we're more successful in cure. So when should you get a mammogram? Generally, the recommendation is that you should start getting a mammogram around the age of 40 and then once a year after that. There was a recommendation that came out probably about eight to 10 years ago by the US Preventative Task Force Services that said, you might not start till the age of, need to start having mammograms until the age of 45 and maybe you only need to get them every other year. But that is not a safe recommendation across the board. So we need to look at things like our family history. Do you have a family history of breast cancer? If you do, talk to your doctor and see when you should start getting screening mammograms. For instance, if you had a first degree relative that is a mother, daughter, or a sister, or a brother, um, and they were diagnosed with breast cancer, let's say at age 45, you should have your first mammogram at 35, so 10 years before the youngest onset of breast cancer in your family. If your mother, let's say, had breast cancer at age 65, you don't wanna wait until you're 55. You should start having mammograms at age 40. And if you have family history, you are not the person that should be having a mammogram every other year. You should be having a mammogram each year. So generally, you should start having mammograms around 40 and have one every year after that. Well, what is not normal? <laughs> no, girlfriend, this is not noticeable at all. Yes, your breast has changed. So look at your breast, feel your breast, and let's talk about what some of the changes are that might mean you should get a mammogram either at an earlier age or sooner than when your next mammogram is due in a year. This, um, Know Your Lemons has been kind of a fun campaign for um, what are some of the breast changes that you see um, that would indicate you should see your doctor and you need a mammogram for this particular problem. And um, I just think this is a fun sort of graphic to kind of identify what are some of the um, abnormalities that mean you need to be checked. So in this first lemon here, if you just have an area of your breast that seems a little bit thicker 
or something about the tissue has changed, but it's a little bit nonspecific. You can't put your finger on it. That's a reason to see a doctor. It may very well be nothing, but it could be the beginning of something. So a thickened area or an area that looks bigger. With this second one here, if you notice a dimpling or kind of an indentation in the breast, sometimes scarring tissue or cancerous tissue because it's not soft and stretchy can start pulling on the tissue around it. So an indentation or a dimple can be a warning sign. Crustiness on your nipple. You've noticed that, I don't know, it just itches or it's irritated. Sometimes it looks kind of red or white. That's something to have checked out. If you notice an area that's red or it feels warm, any new fluid that just kind of spontaneously drains from your nipple, that's not breast milk, obviously, um, but sometimes you'll get a clear fluid or a bloody fluid, or sometimes it can be another um, color, like even kind of greenish. Those are things that need to be checked out. Sores on your breast that don't really heal, um, that just are out of the ordinary any kind of a bump <laughs> sticking out is not normal and needs to be checked out. And of course, if you feel anything that just isn't the way your breasts usually feel or feel like a hard lump, like this little lemon seed here are things to be checked out. Sometimes you might just all of a sudden in a non-pregnant state, see that the veins become really prominent. You may notice that the nipple kind of inverts or sinks in or starts to pull back. That is not a normal event. If your nipple has always been that way, that can be normal. But if it's a change in the way your nipple looks, that is not normal. Or sometimes people just notice a new shape or size um, in their breast. Um, we have patients, especially I would say older women who have significant changes in the way their breasts look. And they didn't really know that that was a warning sign that they should have come in for. Sometimes this will happen with sores on the breast or a nipple that pulls in. And by the time um, they kind of get around to noticing these symptoms, sometimes they present in the emergency room because they have chest pain and it's really something very large in their breasts. So we wanna see these changes at their early stage and identify if there is a problem. I think I skipped over this um, orange peel skin. This is referred to as peau d'orange. And if the skin on the breast just starts to look like there are really prominent pores or um, just sort of looks more like an orange peel, that is actually a warning sign. So any of these things that don't go away within a week or two, are not normal. So be smart about these things. Take care of them. Go see your doctor. This isn't what you wait three months for an appointment for. This is an urgent appointment and come in and get a mammogram and often an ultrasound will be included in that exam. So know your lemons. Freshly squeezed mammograms save lives. So don't be afraid to get your mammograms. It's associated really with very little discomfort. So let's talk about what should you expect if you've never had a mammogram before. It's normal to feel a little bit anxious about it, but it's not something that you need to be dreading. Um, I like this quote that I'd call it oddly uncomfortable. I'll take a mammogram over a pap smear any day, much, much easier. We all have different levels of sensitivity in our breasts, and some people just have very sensitive breasts and therefore may sort of dread their mammogram more than others do. If you find that your breasts tend to just be more, you know, tender, take some ibuprofen or Tylenol about an hour before you come in for your mammogram, and that will help. If you schedule your appointment after your period, your breasts aren't as tender during that time and tell the technician when you come in, if you are one of those people that have really sensitive breasts or you're really sensitive to having your breasts touched. And you know, there are a lot of women in our day and age who have been sexually abused and it's really uncomfortable for them to have their breasts touched. Um, and 
just a little warning that the technician will need to kind of position your breasts on the equipment. So letting her know, we only have female technicians, that you have a sensitivity in this area can be really, really helpful for both you and the technician and just um, being sensitive to what makes you feel uncomfortable. This is a picture of the mammogram equipment, and this is the console that the technician will use. So you, when you come in for a mammogram, you will be asked to undress from the waist up. So you'll take off your top, you'll take off your bra, and then you'll be given a gown that opens in the front. It also closes plenty, so you will not be exposing people if you're in our waiting area. Um, and the technician will then kind of position your breast onto the machine and show you to where to put your hands. Um, and then the top part of the mammogram equipment kind of comes down and it compresses the breast between these two plates. Um, and the technician kind of has to determine exactly how much pressure would be needed for your type of breast. And that can be uncomfortable, but it only lasts for a few seconds. We take a couple of sets of images on each breast from a couple of different angles so that we can make an attempt to see as much of the breast tissue as possible. Um, sorry. Um, so I think that's about it for, you know, sort of how does the mammogram work? What is it like to get um, a mammogram? Um, one other just caution in our day of COVID, one is that we are being extra attentive to cleanliness and minimizing the number of people that are in a waiting room. Usually there's not more than one, sometimes there's two, but um, and being extra cautious again with the way that we clean our equipment. Um, it also is helpful to us to know if you have recently had your COVID vaccine or a booster. What we are noticing is that if you're in that week or two after you have had a vaccine, sometimes the lymph nodes under your arm are a little bit enlarged. So if you can schedule a mammogram be either before you have a vaccine or a few weeks afterwards, that would be much preferred. So that's kind of it on um, mammograms. I also just want to touch on a couple of other things just about cancer and especially in our environment here in Utah. We have one of the nation's highest risks of skin cancer or highest um, rates of melanoma in the country. It's almost twice as high as the national average. So we really need to take care of our skin. Um, oops, sorry, I keep hitting the wrong button here. Um, so cover for certain when you go out in the sun. Use sunscreen. Um, it can make an enormous difference in the amount of damaging rays that get through to your cells. Um, 70 to 80 percent of melanomas can appear on normal skin. Um, sometimes we're um, told that you know it's a change in a mole, but it, it can't get ugh. melanoma can also just be a new growth on normal skin. That's just something different that what you know than what you noticed before. So it's not always just change in a mole. So be attentive to your skin and what it looks like. And if you have a family history of skin cancers, um, you want to be seeing a dermatologist every one to three years to have a thorough skin check done. Uh, melanoma is no joke to deal with. So um, we want to be attentive to our risks for um, skin cancer since our rate in Utah is so much higher than in the rest of the country. So that is it. Um, pretty much um, just once more, I'm going to come back to this quote that, you know, changing our lifestyle is a journey. It's a process and we have to start somewhere. So maybe from today's presentation, you can pick one thing you can do to pick a healthier lifestyle. Eat more vegetables, exercise more frequently. Um, don't set your initial goal to get out there and exercise, you know, maybe seven hours every single week, but start small and make some small changes and then you can go on to make some bigger changes. And again, if you don't take time for your wellness, you will be forced eventually to take time for your illness. 
So be proactive. Think about some changes that you can make today that might decrease your risk for breast cancer personally and what you can do to lead a little bit healthier lifestyle as we come back to those objectives that we had in the beginning. So um, I'm going to attempt here now to fix the sound on my computer so that I can take questions. Anybody has any questions? If you would like to type those into the chat box, and if she can't um, hear us, then I will make sure she gets them and we'll get answers later. So I'll give you a, um, a minute or two to type some answers or some questions in, and we'll get to those. Thank you. Okay, I don't know if I um, you can still hear me. Lori, I can hear you. Can okay, you hear I can hear you now too. Okay. All right. So, the first question is how are fragrances involved with breast cancer? Do you have an answer for that or Yeah, I would say it's probably very loosely, but you know, um things like perfume lotions that may have um damaging chemicals in them. And this isn't something that if you use fragrances, you know, um maybe even infrequently or just a small amount here and there that you are definitely going to get breast cancer. But fragrances can be some of the things that can have some damaging chemicals in them. And, you know, a lot of these things have not been super well studied. So there may be sort of a tangential risk. Um, and it may be related to the timing of the exposure and the duration of the exposure. So, um, it's one of those things that I would probably say to use the least amount possible. <laughs> okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, next question is my last mammogram report recommended. I see a genetic specialist. Can you tell about that? Yes, so when you come in for a mammogram, your technician will sit down with you before the exam and go through um, a series of questions. They'll ask things about your family history. They'll ask things about when you started menstruating, if you've gone through menopause, are you taking any kind of hormonal therapy? Have you had any um, breast surgeries? And our system then computes a risk for you. And if it, the risk is over a certain amount based on all of those factors, it will sort of come out in the end and say that you are a person who could perhaps benefit by meeting with our genetic counselor. Um, so then they will give you the contact for our genetic counselor and you can have a meeting um, that is at no charge for you. And what happens during that meeting is the counselor does a very thorough family history with you and um, again takes into consideration all those other factors that I just mentioned that might contribute to risk. And then she would give you um, a detailed um, set of information about what might be recommended. Are you a person who just, we wanna make sure you get screened every year um, with a mammogram? Maybe we need to add an annual MRI to your breast screening protocol. Maybe you're one of those people that based on your family history um, and what has happened with cancers in your family, do, are you a person that needs to be tested for one, a mutation in one of those BRCA genes um, or perhaps another gene that's associated with an increased risk? So it's really meant to be um, a help for you to assess um, very clearly what your risk is and what your surveillance um, on your breast should be um, and sort of how you should think about your risk going forward. Thanks, Lori. Mm -hmm. um, the next question is, in the news lately, they have been talking about how mammograms can miss cancer in women with more fibrous breasts and that they may need ultrasounds or MRIs to detect cancer. How do we get testing changed for those of us that have fibrous breasts to catch these things before they go to an advanced stage? Really good question. So this is kind of the issue I was talking about with dense breast tissue. 
and you aren't going to know you have dense breast tissue unless you've had a mammogram before and you can see on the report um, because the radiologist will sort of um, report on that scale of density from you know fatty breasts that are easy to see through to extremely dense breasts they will report what your breast tissue is like and when you come in for your mammogram if you've had one before you can ask the technician, have they commented before on what the density of my breast tissue is? Um, and this is one of the reasons that we went to doing 3D mammograms on everybody, because that is a really good screening tool for women who have dense breast tissue. So I would say that's the first thing, because it can see sort of through that dense breast tissue and identify anything that might be abnormal at a much smaller size than the traditional 2D mammography can. So that's the first step. And then if you are one of those people that has very dense breasts, you might really look at some of your other risk factors more closely. And if you wanted to meet with a genetic counselor, you certainly could. Um, and that would be um, where maybe the recommendation for an annual MRI might come in. So just dense breast tissue by itself um, can't really be looked at in isolation. Yes, it puts you at higher risk because you have more tissue growth, more tissue turnover that is at higher risk for a mutation to occur. But we also want to look at that in the context of some of your other risk factors when we consider making recommendations about what your um, screening protocol should look like for you individually. I hope that helps. Great, Laurie. Thank you. That was a great answer. Um, do you have the phone number to schedule a mammogram at St. Mark's? I do. It's 801-268-1500. Um, Thank you, Lori. Sure. Uh, next question is, how much does your breast cancer risk increase with age? That's a really good question. Um, I don't know if I can adequately answer that question, but I would be so happy to get back to you on that. Um, and let you know the average age that women are diagnosed with breast cancer is about 62 to 63 years of age. So in terms of a percentage, I'm not really sure how quickly that changes, um, but clearly as we age and our cells get a little bit older and we have turnover of them, we're at higher risk for a mutation that might cause a cancer, but I don't know um, exactly what that percentage is, you know, per year. Great. Thanks, Lori. Um, next question is, will having kids after the age of 30 or a certain age increase the risk of breast cancer? It won't increase the risk of breast cancer. It just doesn't confer as much protection. And usually when people start having children at a later age, they tend to have um, fewer children, not always for sure. And um, 30 is not for sure um, an age that's too old to have children. Um, but the fewer children you would have, the fewer times their um, estrogen would be interrupted. Okay, thank you. Um, is there a correlation between breast cancer and other cancers like melanoma? There can be, yes. Um, so the cancers that tend to be seen when there is a familial or genetic mutation, there are definitely clusters of cancer that occur. So the cancers that are a little more commonly occurring with breast cancer are ovarian cancer, pancreatic cancer, and yes, melanoma can be associated with um, a clustering of people who also tend to get breast cancer. That doesn't necessarily mean if you've had melanoma that you are at higher risk for breast cancer, however. Great. 
but Last you know, question right now is how common are the three D mammograms, and how long have they been around? Yeah, we've been doing 3D mammograms for, I guess, maybe um, five or six years. And when we first started doing them, um, we did them primarily on women who came in for what we call a diagnostic mammogram. That is, they had identified that they had a problem, a new finding. They had a lump, they had pain, they had um, maybe nipple discharge or some of those other abnormal findings that we talked about. And that's how we primarily use them. And then insurance companies started covering them a little bit more for people who were having screening mammograms. So we started using them with women who said, yes, I want a 3D mammogram. Maybe they knew they had dense breast tissue. And so they said, you know, even if it's $100 extra, I want to have a 3D. And then about a year and a half ago, our radiologist made a case to hospital administration and said, you know, this technology needs to be used on every woman who comes in. And they propose doing 3D mammograms on every single woman, um, even if their insurance said that they wouldn't pay. Um, and that happened probably about a year and a half ago. The benefit is just so uh, marked that I think you're going to see if hospitals aren't doing that already, that more and more will start to, and it will become something that all insurance companies will eventually cover. Great. Thank you, Lori. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions at the time. I am seeing a lot of thank yous though. Uh, and I would like to thank you also. I, even though I've heard this a few times, I always learn something new. Uh, you're such a, an easy person to listen to and your information is amazing. Uh, so thank you, Lori, very, very much. We need a lot of thank yous and a lot of thanks. Great information. Um, thanks so for thank you everyone. Thanks for participating and um, come and get your mammograms. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We'll have another presentation soon. Take care. Thank you.